to give you all the glory because all the glory is yours, Lord Jesus. You are in the throne of Jesus. And we, are, we are seated in heavenly places right next to you, Lord. Yes. That is the truth, Lord Jesus. You are the truth, the life, the way, the life. You are, Father God, our heart. We bind every stronghold right now. We bind you here with the Jesus. Yeah. We declare healing for those who are in pain right now. We declare healing for the broken yes. hearted right now. Yes. And we command you, say, Shut up, my son. Come on, yes. Jesus. Jesus. You have no power, no authority over any of these people. They all belong to God. Yes. It's already been raised. You will not win. You will not. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your precious Hug. presence. Hug. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father God, we invite you to open up our hearts to receive yes. the word of today, Lord yes. Jesus. Anoint the words, Father God. Bless the words. Water that seed that we're going to hear today, Lord Jesus. Yes. Not that we, we will leave the same way we came in, Lord Jesus. Yes. Because we're here so that we come out different, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But you're the only one that can do it. Holy Spirit, it is your your job to help us do this. Yes. Yes. We believe it, Lord. We believe yes. that the Holy Spirit is a comforter, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We love you so much. We glorify you. We worship you. This is your house. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. That was a wonderful time of worship. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Nanette. Thank you for leading us in worship. And all the songs were very anointed today. We thank you so much. So this week... Um, I was talking to the Lord about what we're going to talk about, what I'm going to speak about today. And um, he definitely downloaded the words that I'm going to speak today, this morning. I thought uh, by preparing everything that I have here that I'll be prepared, I'll be ready. Um, you know, he had, he had another plan for me. <laughs> he had, definitely had another plan for me. So what I want to talk about today is, is Jesus. One of the, we, we, don't, we don't talk about Jesus enough. We don't. His, like it said in the song, the last song we sang, right? The name of Jesus is power, healing, and life. But we don't speak about him enough. We don't talk about Jesus enough. Why? Because... Fear of people um, like telling us, well, why should we believe in one person? That he is the only way to God. And that's how it's always been. Even back in the days when Jesus walked through the streets, they didn't believe in him. They said, through you, we, we have to go through you to get to God. Why is that? But it says it in the word. Right? It says in John 14, 6. I'm sorry, I didn't give you guys this uh, to put on the board, but I'll just speak it anyway. This, like I said, this is all downloading like this morning as I'm speaking. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus lived through a time where people doubted his power, doubted his works, and doubted everything that he had to say. We're living in a similar time right now, yeah. right? We are living in a similar time. Just uh, last week, this, this past week, I saw a commercial on uh, YouTube. I saw commercials on TV. I was astonished about what I saw. 
It says, he gets us. We're finally talking about Jesus. Amen. Jesus is finally being put out there to be spoken about because it became, Jesus' name became a stigma at first. It was like, well, why? Why Jesus? Right? Why is it that we have to speak to Jesus or go through Jesus in order to get to God? That's the way God wanted it. But people don't see it that way. Why, why, why is the question. Why? It's God's plan. But don't, people don't listen to God's plan. We think into our own thinking and into our own thoughts, our own knowledge. We're not giving into what God has for us. We're just not. Amen. So what I had prepared this morning was, you know, how do we see Jesus? And how do we see Jesus in this day and age? Okay? So this day and age right now is not any different from the way it was back in the day. Okay? We have political issues, hypocrisy, greed. All right? You got one side fighting against another. You got a battle, battles going on between churches. Well, you know what? Believe in us. Believe in us. Believe in us. All right. But why aren't we? Why aren't we following what the word says? God's plan. God's word. The Bible is there for a reason, right? It's not there for us to just hold up other books on the shelf. It's not pieces of paper that's just hanging out inside a book. Just say, "Hey, look, I got a Bible." It's sitting on my desk. I'm a Christian. I got a Bible. Crack it open. Amen. Open it up. See what God's plan is for you from day one. I like to see right now as history repeating itself. Except now we're finally talking about Jesus. Back then, Jesus was seen as a rebel, right? Jesus took to the streets, spoke the word of God. Those that were compelled by the words quit their jobs and left their homes. Hearing God talk to them that they too were being spoken to God and that, you know what, you leave your families, join your allegiance with Jesus Christ, spread the word. I finally saw that last week. There's commercials finally going up. Open yourself up to Jesus. He was a rebel then. Jesus is still a rebel now. He's still a rebel now. He's still going against everything that society has built up in thinking. Back then we had, well, we had the Pharisees, we had the Sadducees, right, controlling everything. Everything from the temple the Roman Empire collecting taxes, the Pharisees building. And the funny thing is, there was a scheme. There was a big scheme back then. The Roman Empire did not, the Roman Empire did not keep the Sadducees and the Pharisees from doing what they wanted to do as long as they were receiving the taxes. They were receiving what they wanted. So the Romans said, hey, all right, you know what? Believe in what you want to believe, do what you want to do. So now, you have people, people running government, not, with, not through the word of God. They say they were using the word of God. They weren't. Instead, they used the word of God against the poor, against the lowly, against the ones that do truly believe in the word of God. They use them as threats. They use them as ways of create of, of Collecting money from people who couldn't afford to do the things that they wanted. What are we doing now? What are governments doing now? Jesus was the way. Jesus was the way to break all of that up. He went into the temple. What did he do? He flipped the tables of the tax collectors. Right? He was like, you're, you're, in God's, you're on God's land. You're in God's temple and you are collecting taxes yeah. on his sacred land. What do we do now? 
there are some churches doing the same thing. The same thing. Yeah. G5 planes. <laughs> Mansions. Flashy clothing. In God's house. Using God's money. That's the same as tax collecting back in the day. What were they wearing in the temple? What were, what were they wearing? What were the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees wearing? They were wearing those nice threads, yes. right? Beautiful colors. We're no different now. History is repeating itself. But there's one name. I'm going to repeat it again. I know I'm repeating myself over and over again, but... There is power in his name. That's why I say it over and over again. And that's Jesus. So was he a rebel? In Luke chapter 5, verses 29 to 32, it says, Later Levi held a, ba a banquet. Mind you, Levi was a tax collector. He's a tax collector. But Jesus called on him. He said, you know what? I want to, I want to share the word with you. We're going to walk together, right? Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as his guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not to those who think they are righteous, but to those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Amen. He's talking to the tax collector. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Sadducees. He's not talking to the people like you and I, where we believe in Jesus Christ and we give our life to Jesus Christ. We give our life to, to God. He's talking to the ones who are perverting the word. He was talking to the ones who were using God's word against the people. Not anymore. He wasn't going to allow it. They would say, who is this man? They would ask who? I mean, they would ask, um, who are they? Community leaders feared them. Religious leaders abhorred them. We're talking about Jesus and the disciples. Anyone that joined Jesus in his word, in his quest to do what God had planned for him. In Luke 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, the day a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. Then Jesus said to, these, to his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for going, for doing evil? I'm sorry. Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? He looked around at them one by one and then said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. It's the Sabbath, right? But you see how the religious, the righteous, use the word of God and say, well, you know what, it's Sabbath, we need to do, we do nothing on that day. Someone needed healing. Who was Jesus to stop that? Jesus wasn't going to stop that. Amen. He wasn't going to break God's rule, God's law, to satisfy what the righteous wanted. Amen. He healed that man. He needed help. Why should I not help him? Why should I not help my fellow man? That's what he did. He went against the Pharisees. He went against the religious authority. These, according to them, these men, Jesus and the disciples were considered outlaws. 
They were wanted off the streets as they were considered troublemakers. Sure, Jesus um, you know, challenged authority, but they weren't spreading hate. They weren't terrorizing people. They were sharing the truth of God. They were healing through the word of God. Jesus was also calling out the righteous authority that they knew they were sinners and that they needed to repent. You're holding, well, they were holding God's word as this is what you are going to do. You have to follow it word by word. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Amen. Your man needs healing, you heal. Your man needs deliverance, you deliver. Amen. It doesn't stop on Sunday because of a football game. It doesn't stop on a, on. On a Friday because of a basketball game or Saturday night because of a party. You bring healing to that person because God wanted that. God wanted the healing to happen. These were men who were using their righteous authority, living in sin, and using their authority to oppress people. So was he a rebel? Yeah. But not a rebel like you might, like everyone might think. When we look at rebels, what do we think? Gangs. People that do crime, you know, criminals. He wasn't a criminal. He just went against the religious authority that was trying to hold people down, trying to oppress people. We have that going now. And we need Jesus more now than before. History is repeating itself. Was Jesus a politician? Nope. He was not a, he was not a politician. He did not play sides. He did, not, he did not need to win a popularity contest. That, I mean, after all, polit politics is a popularity contest, right? We're going to vote with the one who, who has the yeah. right approach to things. Mm -hmm. Does it always get done? No. It doesn't always get done. Jesus lived in a time where politi the political system was filled with greed, hypocrisy, and oppression. History is repeating itself. Yeah. Jesus was born during the Roman Empire's power. Israel was under Roman control. As I said earlier, the Romans didn't force the people to change their religion or their customs as long as Israel was paying their taxes to Rome. Rome would install a king and exact taxes in many different ways. For example, each person in a family got taxed. Your two-year-old child got taxed. If they could, your pet would be taxed. Chanel there would be taxed. <laughs> if they could. Farmers got taxed on their crops. Fishermen got taxed on their catch. Travelers were taxed for using roads. The priests were charging religious taxes as well. You see, the political and the religious factions, they were all together. They were all in the same accord. The Pharisees were the most religious conservative leaders. They had the most influence among the common working poor. They believed a king would come and one day conquer Rome with violence and free their nation. The Pharisees preyed on the mostly illiterate population by adding extra rules and requirements designed to hold people down. The Sadducees were the wealthy aristocrats who were capitalizing on the Roman rule. They made themselves wealthy with unfair taxes, created money-making schemes that forced people to pay higher uh, prices to participate in even the religious events. What's going on now? High inflation, right? Same thing. It's happening all over again. But guess who's showing up? Jesus is showing up. We're finally including Jesus in our conversation. Thank God. Because before we left Jesus out, it was all about how do we fix this? How do we fix that? Are we using God's word to fix it? 
Are we allowing God in to fix our problems? Nope. We are doing it all in our own accord. We are doing it all in our own interests. Politicians use their special interests in order to line their pockets, right? I'm sorry to say that's how it is. But if we truly let God in, like, you know, like it says on the dollar bill, right? In God we trust. If we honestly let God lead to fix, to repair, to do all of this, he can get it done. He can get it done. But we are not the men of Proverbs. We are not letting him lead. Our greed is leading. The greed of our country. The greed of the rich. The greed of the politicians. History is repeating itself. And Jesus is back. He's coming back. He's going to set everyone free. He's going to set every believer that went through everything that he asked, that God asked us to do, to follow him, to give our life to him. And if we follow it, we will be saved. So what's Jesus' position in all of this? Was he aligned with the religious elite? Was he aligned with the wealthy and the powerful? He did none of that. He went from town to town, offering hope, new life, and modeling a different way of life to change the world. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the works are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. Instead of pursuing power, money, or religious authority, he shared a loving and sacrificially generous way of living. He chose to stay away from schemes. He chose to use a better way, God's way. Now, as we all know, in politics, if you had the popular vote, you win. If you had the money and the right people behind you, you will win. But Jesus already won. Why? He followed God's plan. Amen. He had God's way. Amen. He had God's word. Come on. I also want to look at one thing, and that's um, I wanted to look at, at Jesus. Did Jesus struggle? Did he have hope? Because much like Moses, Jesus endured his own moment in the wilderness. Jesus spent 40 days with God in the wilderness and fasted that entire time. As a human, Jesus fasted from nourishment. Fasting for 40 days is the longest time a human can fast without doing permanent harm to themselves. By doing this, Jesus fully immerses himself in the experience to identify with the depths of our human experience. He does this to lead us to freedom. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in the, their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered, when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus aligned himself. He aligned himself to our physical body to understand what we were going through. Now imagine, he's the son of God. He could just simply say, you know what, I don't need to go through this. I don't need to go through pain. 
I don't need to see what poverty is like. Mm -hmm. I don't need to see what it is to be hungry. But no, he said, I'm going to put myself in their shoes. Amen. I'm going to live the life that they have lived. Because how can I say that I am for them if I don't even know how they live? We have the same thing now with our politicians or with, you know, even the religious authority who don't understand how people are living right now. They don't. But Jesus allowed himself to do that. He put himself in human form. Well, he was in human form already. But he allowed himself to go through the 40 days and 40 nights, the temptation. But he didn't give in to what the devil wanted. The devil was testing him. You're hungry, eat, make bread. Be fed. He said, no. I'm going to follow God in God's way. I want to see what each man is going through. And he did that. Jesus is going to come back around. He knows what we've gone through. He gets us. He understands us. Amen. We just don't see it. Well, others, well, we don't see it. Others don't see it as well. People who don't believe in Jesus Christ don't see it. They're blind. Thank you. They're block, they block it out. They block it out. And a lot of the time, you know, we go through hurts and pains where we're like, all right, well, if, if Jesus was for us, if God is for us, then why am I going through this? Why am I going through poverty? Why am I going through so much death in my life? Right? That's the enemy putting it in your mind that, you know what, it's done. Why are you believing in someone that's causing so much despair? It's a lie, everyone. It's a lie. We have to give ourselves to the Lord. Give ourselves to God's way. Open the Bible, read the word. Allow ourselves to immerse ourselves into the word of God. So then we know what God's true will for us is. Not to say, hey, look, I got a Bible on my center table. Isn't it pretty? Mm -hmm. I think it's a nice accessory piece. Doesn't it make my table look good? Mm -hmm. No, crack it open. Spend time with the Lord. Hear what he has for you. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Jesus is calling his believers to seek the kingdom of God. We are here to elevate God's priorities before and above our own. Jesus teaches us this because it is hard to do. So what is Jesus trying to show us? He struggled. He struggled like, a, like as any human has. Is there hope? Yes, there is hope in Jesus and in God. Give yourself to Jesus. Like it said in John 14, 6, right? He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Jesus did suffer a lot, and God brought him a new life and restoration. He will do the same for you. Jesus' resurrection shows us what Jesus really looks like, God's love. We see pain, we see anguish on the cross. But in the end, it's resurrection. It's restoration. It's the devil getting his arrows thrown back at him. The devil thought he had him. He didn't have them. That's right. Surprise. Devil, you never had him. And you will never have us. Us as believers in Christ, he will not, the devil will not have us. Because we have Jesus. I also lean into the ministry. So how does this align with the ministry, the, the deliverance ministry? Jesus was a rebel. Jesus was not a politician. He sought to keep captives free. 
He brought the good news to each person to align their life with God's word. That's what our ministry is about. He showed that God can take away your struggles as long as you put your hope in God and in Jesus. It is easier said than done. But I say to you, surrender and give it all to God. And if we do align with God's word, it shall be done. Yes. So, like I said in the beginning, I thought I, I knew what I had prepared, but the right. Lord kept telling me, it's more like history repeating itself. We got to lean into Jesus. We got to lean into his love, his mercy. We also need to get healing. Amen. Because we need to cleanse our heart. Yes. When we are at when we are when we are there at the gates, we need to show God, you know what? My heart is clean. I'm ready for your glory. Yes. I'm ready for your grace, your true grace. We got to give ourselves up to the Lord. So during his time on earth, Jesus was always inviting people to become his followers. He said to those by the Sea of Galilee, follow me. He invited his listeners to come to him, to come by faith, to come for healing, to come for hope, to come for happiness. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Perhaps today, you feel, God, uh, you feel Christ himself is speaking to you. Imagine if he were in this room giving this invitation to you. What would you do? Well, brothers and sisters, he really is here. In this very room, he is inviting you to become his child, his follower, his disciple. And if you feel the tug of the Lord come up, let us pray with you. Come willingly, come courageously. Do not worry about being seen or what others think. This is your time with him. He is calling you as an individual, a couple, as a family. He died for you and rose again. His blood washes away our sins, and he gives you new life if you come to him. So come to Christ now. The Lord is calling to receive, um, to re calling to you to receive His salvation. If you have not made Him your Lord and Savior, or you have decided to recommit your life to the Lord, repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus I know that I am a sinner. I, know that I'm a sinner. I come to you and ask for forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. And invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. And I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you. So we come to the part of our, um, of our service uh, where we offer our tithes and offerings. You can give through text by texting 702-766-3466 by texting GIVE. Or you can go to Luke418ChurchNevada.org and go into the giving portion of the website. All right, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for providing and satisfying for our every want and need. Your word says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and that the vats will overflow with new wine. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply them what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. May Jesus Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with all the fullness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So in closing, 
we go out into the world as light. The evidence, the evidence that you are within us shall shine bright as the sun, Lord. We also go out as your faithful warriors and do your will in setting the captives free in Jesus' mighty name. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Amen.